Okay, welcome to a, uh, another book review. This one's going to be on the Book of Enoch. Um, this is uh, not really a, a book. I suppose you could get it in hard copy, but it's available online. And um, for some reason, multiple formats. I'm not really sure why I didn't, didn't spend a whole lot of time doing the historical search on this kind of stuff. Just because I'm not that interested in it. Um, more interested in what the contents of the book are for the time being. And uh, so I read it. I read it over the course of, I guess, a couple of days. Once, uh, a couple of days ago, I read 60 chapters, and I read the other 45 um, here recently. So, uh, well, today. So I figured while it was fresh on my mind, I would get this out uh, for people who may be interested to kind of get an idea of what's in this thing, because I had no idea what was in it. It's not a book of the Bible or anything, um, but it is referenced in the Bible. So I got a good understanding, I guess, in general of what it is. Just one read through and a couple go back and look at type things. And um, that's what this book review is going to be, just a review of that and uh, give you an idea of what to expect if you was to ever pick up the book of Enoch uh, or look for it online. So what is what is the pros and cons of this book? Well, uh, I would say the biggest pro to the book is that it's interesting. Um, there's, there's interest in, uh, I guess spelled words on the screen, whatever. There's interesting, uh, historical information in the book. And we know at least some of it's true because it's quoted in Jude. Um, what's really interesting as you read through the book is that other things seem to be clearly alluded to in the Bible or the Bible, th this book is alluding to the things in the Bible. Um. So that, that leaves you with two possibilities, right, logically. Either the Bible writers, and this is a humanistic look at the scriptures, but um, the view of inspiration uh, that I believe is the best one is one that, you know, the Bible is written by God, but he uses men. And the, the men, you know, each one like Paul wrote the epistles and, you know, James wrote his epistle. The, these men write, and it really is those men writing, these books, yeah, it's, it's inspired by God in a way that's, you know, hard to understand. And there's different types of inspiration and, and w like ways of inspiration. Pick up a systematic theology book and just have fun wrestling through mechanical inspiration and, um, you know, all those forms of uh, theories on how it actually worked. But the one, uh, just simply, simply put, that I would say is true is it is 100% God writing it. And it's also 100% man writing it. Um, that's so, you know, that being said, we can know that these writers of the New Testament had information. Uh, they knew of what this book contained. That's the easiest way of saying it. Because Jude straight, straight you know, quotes it. And as I read through this, there were themes and things uh, eschatologically, knowing prophecy, um, on an average level as I do, um, I, I detected some, some similar themes, uh, some interesting stuff, and then there's some things that are referenced also by Peter and others uh, that seem to either, you know, it's either, like I said, logically speaking, either the, the Bible writers got it from, from this book, or Enoch got it from them, depending on where you date the book, uh, which it seems like <clears throat> some estimates put it uh, 200 years BC, which would then mean that the book was existent when <clears throat> the biblical writers wrote, which would mean that they were familiar with the book. And so there it goes. You get in all these other, you know, back and forth things that with people who would go both ways. For example, I don't believe um, that the Septuagint, so called, existed in the form that people think it did. What they do is they take Origins, uh, Hexpola would say, here you go, but that's hundreds of years after the New Testament's written, and they'll, they'll try to say, we'll see the New Testament writers are quoting the Old Testament Septuagint here, and they'll go to the Septuagint reading, whereas I would say that Origen um, has basically just tampered with the Old Testament to make it match the New Testament writing, that it's not really quoting the Old Testament specifically like that at all, which is a whole other topic in itself, which talks about how... Um, New Testament writers quoted Old Testament and such, but getting really off far off base to talk about this. <clears throat> Long story short, really convoluted when you start thinking about, you know, how it was used. We don't know. 
but we could, we could just guess, and it's a safe guess, that the New Testament writers uh, had access to this book and knew its contents. So what's the negatives? Well, as you can read, hopefully, given my poor spelling, um, I just now wrote this like two minutes ago. Um, I think the biggest negative is it, it likely, and well, it does, ascribe words to God that God never said. Um, I don't really know what else is to say there. It, did God say those things? I mean, I can't say authoritatively either way, but I would suspect that he, he didn't say at least most of those things or some of those things um, that's, that's ascribed to God in that book. And if he did, you know, like why didn't Christians throughout history have access to this? Did God want to secretly hide his word? You know, uh, that's why I say I'm very skeptical and cynical even um, of God speaking outside of uh, the given revelation of the Bible. So that's the biggest negative in this is you're, then who, who is writing this and why is it coming out this way? Um, more than likely, it's a tradition of, you know, what people think God said then or, you know, just falsely ascribing things to God, and I don't like it. Um, it gives faulty historical information. It's covered for in other sites you could look up. And honestly, the biggest vibe I got from it, especially in the middle part of the book toward the end, uh, when he gets toward the parables and stuff, it's really weird, and at times it's really unintelligible. Like you, no one in their right. I mean, <laughs> it would take you. You'd have to be crazy to think you could even interpret some parts of this book. And some people would be like, "Oh yeah, like Revelation." No, not like Revelation. The Book of Revelation, you could you could go through the Bible and consistently get a good, solid understanding uh, and interpretation of those symbols used by how the Bible uses and, and gives you the definition of those symbols. And maybe one day I would more specifically show you what I'm talking about. An example off the top of my head is in Revelation 12, where it has, you know, the woman and it has the, the stars and the moon and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, what does this mean? You know, it's so hard to understand what this means. Well, there's only one other place in the Bible that uses the same, like, you know, imagery and illustration and it's back with joseph and so it's it's easy to see well who who was those representing and it's representing joseph's brothers so why not there and why not be indicative of, of israel you know really simple and it gives you a way of interpreting that with this book it's just you know it's off the deep end it's it's really crazy really weird which led to me skimming through the redundant weirdness it, just try to read it, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. At one point, it's talking about, you know, this astrological astronomy or something. Like, you can't follow it. You can't follow it. So, and, you know, I've heard some stuff. I've read up on some stuff and saying that it's um, it's actually written to angels or something. Or he was the prophet to angels and all that. Really weird. So, who would I recommend this stuff to? Well, you, for one, you got to be spiritually mature. I'm not saying I am. Um, just saying, I, I would say the minimum requirements. What I'm talking about there is that you are a Christian, uh, because if you're not a Christian, who knows what you're not safeguarded against in reading this book. And number two, I would I would say that you, as a spiritually mature person, you need to have read the Bible first. Uh, it's very dishonoring to God if you've never read the full Bible and you're starting to pick up these non-canonical books that talk about God and ascribe words to God that he didn't say, and you're just going to go through there and read those, like, there's something wrong with you, um, spiritually, if that's what your desire is. Um, we, should, we should have at least read through the Bible one time before we start reading through all these other things that are ascribing things to God that he didn't say, especially. And I think it's very helpful to teachers, which is the whole reason that I even read this book to begin with, is I'm supposed to be doing a Sunday night service on uh, Hebrews 11 and specifically what it's talking about with Enoch and uh, I felt it necessary to kind of get an understanding of this book and see what it's about and see if there's anything in there that worth mentioning uh, which maybe there is maybe there isn't I don't think it's necessarily directly relevant to Hebrews 11 and what's being said there but if you're doing a character study on Enoch uh, there's not a whole lot in the Bible about Enoch and this book definitely has some really interesting stuff going on in it uh, lastly, I'd like to show you really quickly here just uh, where these sources are for for these books. Um, one of them is going to be coming from this. You can see the URL up here, the Book of Enoch, with dashes and whatnot in it. And you can see on this page, 
that it's, it, I mean, it's really, look how long, 105. Some of these chapters are extremely short, though. Um, you could you could see it has introduction, what of the book, and any, this introduction thing right here is extremely long to read. Uh, I read most of that. I skimmed through one small section of it, because uh, I can. Uh, it gives you, you know, this is what's quoted in it. And uh, here's the other thing I was going to mention. Uh, if you do decide to read through this, they're not the same. And uh, here's another one. This is the Book of Enoch Online. And uh, on the front page, it has all these other wicked, you know, false gospel type, gospel Thomas crap type stuff that I would stay away from. And uh, here it has, you know, here's this. It says section one. It goes to the watchers. And well, at the end of this section, it's going to give you the parables. And then you go to the next section of the book, supposedly. Um, but this, this is not the exact same as the other one i guess there's different translations or whatnot but there's there's a section i couldn't find it i mean i, I read straight through from uh actually a whole nother site there was a third there's a third site where i was reading through the book of enoch i read the first 60 chapters and then i actually figured out this site has the other 45 so i come on here and read these 45 chapters and i, I realized like well there's there's something different being alluded to in a video I was then listening to on the Book of Enoch. And sure enough, I come in here and find it at the very end of the second section, which is like called the parables instead of the watchers. At the end of it, it talks about Enoch being translated and taken to heaven at a certain point in time. So, I mean, maybe it's in this one, but where I read it the way that I did, I read it in multiple you know, websites and whatnot and different, I guess, translations or whatever, maybe different ways the book's constructed. It just confused me <laughs> all over the place. So maybe I would suggest if you're going to read it, to read straight through on this site. And if you're highly fascinated with it, you know, get it on another site, read through it and see if you see any differences. Either way, uh, just at the very end of this video, I guess it's, it's worth noting that early on in this book, um, let's see if I could find it here really quick. Because like I said, it is different than, than the one I originally uh, read. Now here you go, here you go. Um, and the women conceiving brought forth giants. And you, so you, in this book you have um, an account of what one of the interpretations of the book of Genesis is. In the book of Genesis, of course, you have... Uh, you have the the part where people dispute and, and see like you know what what is talking about when it's talking about uh, the men of renown the mighty men of old um, where you know some people say well the the sons of God and the daughters of men um, that's talking about just you know godly men and ungodly women or godly men and whatever women um, and some will say well that's actually demonic hybrids and offsprings and that's some interpretations back and forth and then you have what's said in Jude about it and you have what's said in Peter and you know taking them all together everybody's confusing everybody debates and everybody argues well back here in this book you have this is the account that talks about it the problem is uh, some people uh, say they argue that even here as all scholars never agree on anything um, that it's saying that these giants were like hundreds of foot tall and stuff. Well, <laughs> clearly that's baloney. And then some other people say, well, that's not true. And all, you know. So whatever. Take it with a grain of salt, obviously. Be very skeptical. Uh, I found this part really interesting here where it talks about how these, these 200 angels come down and it names a few of these demons. Uh, this is the part where it gets sketchy and you better be spiritually mature and at least saved. Um, and it talks about these these demons teaching them different things and sorcery and witchcraft and the hybrid offspring eat eat animals and drink their blood and eat people um, very uh, interested especially when you think about uh, the allure of modern uh, stuff people with vampires and whatnot and also just the last thing I'll say I'm coming to the end of this video it talks about how uh, Noah looked supposedly again this is not Bible and uh, the way he looked is eerily similar to the very pale looking uh, you know way of the way that vampires in modern times are like you know supposedly looking and the the daddy supposedly thought well he must be a demonic hybrid because of the way he looks so that must be the way they looked so there you go that's some interesting stuff from this book and for what it's worth there you go. There's a review on it. Um, until next review, I have read other books. I'm going to do one soon. Uh, God bless.